Well, guys, we have been talking about the blessing in our lives. And of course, not just a blessing, but what we call the blessing. And we understand that um, uh, Adam had this blessing on his life. Uh, when, uh, when the father spoke to Adam in the garden, the blessing was pronounced over him that it would be a blessing and go forth, multiply and um, take dominion over the whole earth. And that blessing is part and parcel of taking dominion over the earth. And, and what we find is that Jesus, through his redemption, has redeemed us and brought that blessing back. And we're just going to have a read of this. Uh, some exciting scriptures in Revelation chapter 5. Now, uh, the word says that as we read Revelation, there's a blessing involved. Now, a lot of people are scared to re read Revelation, and Revelation has been butchered terribly by people and taken out of context. But it is uh, a revelation from Jesus, who got it from uh, the Father, who gave it to an angel, and then that angel gave it to John. So there is a passing on of this revelation. But if we go over to chapter 5, we find um, some kind of cryptic. And we've got to understand that uh, revelation is a lot of imagery. But uh, it looks quite cryptic until we understand. And we're going to unveil uh, some, of the, some of the things in this chapter, hopefully, so that you'll understand what's uh, what's actually taking place and so that you can see yourself in the context of what we're talking about so in um, chapter 5 and verse 1 let's read it uh, now I'm reading from the uh, I think it's the New English translation let's have a look I'll tell you um, up the front it's uh, modern English there we go the modern English translation so if you're looking to to read along yours might be a bit different but uh, in verse, uh, chapter 5 of Revelation, verse 1, it says, Then I saw at the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it which is a bit of a dilemma. And then uh, this is John the Revelator. So what's happened is that John's been translated into heaven and he's beginning to see some things that, which are a mystery. And he said, I began to weep loudly. So what's happened is he's seen this, this event taking place and he's realized that there's hopelessness about it. No one's able to do anything about this thing. And no one's worthy to open this scroll, whatever the scroll is, there is no one. And then he began to weep because of the hopelessness. Then one of the elders said to me, uh, this is one of the elders in heaven, uh, don't weep. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. And he is able to open this scroll. And loose its seven seals. And I saw the Lamb of God in the midst of the throne and four living creatures. And in the midst of the elders standing as though it had been slain, having, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into the whole earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he'd taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one having a harp, golden bowls of full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they began to sing a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and listen to this, and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every living tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And you have made us kings and priests unto our God, and we shall reign on the earth. 
Then I looked and heard around the throne the living creatures and the, all the elders of many angel, uh, elders' voices and of many angels, numbering ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, "Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and." And this is what I wanted to come to, blessing, blessing. So in the beginning, Adam had this scroll in his hand. He had really, it's like it was a legal document of the earth. And then what, was, what happened was that the scroll was taken from Adam, or this earth lease was taken from Adam. And then there, it was locked up. Satan, uh, you know, Satan had this lease. And we go over to, uh, to uh, let's go over to Luke. Chapter 4, we find that Jesus in a discourse with Satan, or Lucifer, we, we were talking about him last week. Um, Luke chapter 4. Now this is, what's happened is that, uh, that uh, Jesus has been taken by the Spirit of God out into the wilderness. And he's going through temptations, going through testing. So Satan is coming and he's trying him and uh, trying him on for size. And uh, we have this, this discourse. And in verse uh, chapter 4, uh, verse number 5, the devil taking him up onto a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this power and all this glory for it has been delivered unto me. And so we see this is, this is Satan tempting uh, Jesus with the earth lease. This, he's got something. It's been delivered to him, he said. Now, how did it get delivered? Well, God didn't deliver it. God delivered it to Adam. And then Adam, what happened was that Adam delivered this earth lease to Satan in, a, in the most treacherous act. Uh, uh, um, so we see treason being committed as Adam gives all of the earth lease over into the hands of Satan. Uh, essentially, he worshipped Satan. He took his worship from God. God had given him everything, and then what he did was, uh, for a moment of pleasure, gave all that seed, everything that God had given him, he handed over to the enemy, God's enemy, and of course the enemy of our souls as well. And so we find that here, now we noticed in Revelation that, that uh, all this had been handed back to Jesus. Now, of course, Jesus didn't bow to Satan, but what happened was that he redeemed this earth lease with his blood. He ransomed and got the earth lease and everyone in it back, or everything, every bit of property that was connected with it back. But he didn't do it the way that Satan wanted him to do it, which was to bow his knee to Satan. He willingly subjected himself to the penalty of sin. And then when, once that penalty had been paid for all humanity, and that is the redemption of all creation through his blood. Then, what, uh, and he paid that price. And what happened was that the earth lease was now bought back by the blood. It says of Jesus, the Anointed One. And so Jesus now has been given this earth lease. Now it's it it has been his legally, but we see, and you you just got to have a look outside you see that all of creation is still under the bondage of sin. And so we are now waiting for creation to manifest. Eventually what's going to happen is that death uh, and all of its associates is going to be cast into the lake of fire. So that means that everything that, that Adam did through his transgression is going to finish. But it hasn't finished yet. But legally, Jesus has the earth lease back. Now, we're going to have a look at some illustrations that Jesus gives of the earth lease uh, so that we can understand that we have received this blessing back into our lives. Now, it's not automatically activated. 
But there's a, there's a principle that activates this blessing inside of us. Now, we have been recreated. We talked about this last week. We're in a new covenant. And this covenant contains the blessing. But there's a new bylaw of this new covenant. And we have been recreated into the image of Jesus the anointed. We have his nature inside of us. We've been translated from sin and darkness uh, uh, and the, the power of darkness into the kingdom of, of the, our father's dear son. And we have uh, the reason we're translated, remember we said we can't work our way out of sin. We needed someone to come and redeem us from sin. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He redeemed us. And as we receive this redemption by faith, not working for it, but we believe that Jesus has done that for us, then what happens is that we become new creations immediately. In our spirits, we're recreated into the image. And then we're citizens of heaven. So you don't have to die to become a citizen of heaven. You're a citizen as soon as you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what happens is that you're translated immediately into the kingdom of heaven. So dying physically is that's all you do. You're gonna, you know, you if your body it actually doesn't disintegrate, it breaks down. And then what's going to happen is the redemptive blood of Jesus has this new glorified body, which will be using the parts of your body. So eventually, if you die physically, those physical parts of your body are going to be recollected in the redemption of Jesus eventually. And they're going to be put back together, but it's going to be a glorified body, which won't be mortal. That means it won't be subject to death sickness or anything that's got to do with sin because sin will no longer be part of your life physically that means it can't affect you physically now sin is no more a part of your life spiritually sin has been eradicated you died with christ we saw that in romans i think we saw it in romans a couple of a couple of sessions ago where we were crucified with christ you were crucified with Christ, you were buried with Christ, and you were raised up with Christ. Now you're sitting in heavenly places, Ephesians says, with Christ Jesus. Well, you know, obviously, physically, we're here. What's, he, what's Paul talking about? Is he rambling on? No, what he's talking about is that legally your spirit now can sit right next to the heavenly Father, the holy God in heaven without sin. So Jesus' blood has redeemed us from sin. It's not like the blood of bulls and goats we said last week. It's, it's so effective that it has recreated your spirit sinless. And that's the whole point of Hebrews is that you are no longer, you can come boldly to the throne of grace or goodness or favor and receive help. Why? Because there is no barrier now. Jesus broke down that barrier and the petition of the law, it says, I think in Colossians, it talks about the law being a barrier. Well, what does the law do? Well, it, it, it proves that people are sinners and the law has been done away. The reason the law has been done away is because Jesus has paved a new way of sinlessness. He has, he has made you sinless. Now, what's happening is as you listen to this word of faith, which I am preaching, you're receiving the faith to believe what Jesus has done. You see, we receive the knowledge of his, re or the revelation of the knowledge of Christ Jesus through faith. That's what we were saying. Preaching is not just positive. It can be positive thinking. But it's not just positive thinking. The power of preaching, Paul said that preaching, we'll rephrase that, he said that his preaching was the power of God. So there's power in this preaching. Um, the, you know, the Gentiles call it foolishness. Why? Because they don't understand. Why would you get up and preach every Sunday? What's the purpose? Well, the purpose is that in these words that are being preached, there is the power of the gospel. That means I can preach the redemption of Jesus Christ, which I'm doing now. And in these words, there is the image and the power of these words to bring themselves apart, uh, to pass. 
So that means when, you know, when you are listening to healing sermons, you're receiving the revelation of redemption so that Jesus bore your sicknesses and he carried your diseases. So that means you don't have to carry them. But here's the thing. If you don't know that, you won't be effectively working out your redemption. So how does faith come? Well, faith comes from hearing this message. What is faith? Faith is the evidence of things you can't see. Faith is really looking into the spirit realm where you've been reborn and just receiving receiving what Jesus has done for us in the spirit realm. And then if we believe it, what we do is we find we have an outworking in the natural realm. Now, here's the thing. If you don't hear what Jesus has done, you don't, there's no way for you to have the faith to receive it. It's like this. We could say that you have an inheritance and that inheritance has been placed in the bank. But the only way for you to go and get that inheritance, uh, you, you know, if it's millions of dollars, is you, you could pout and cry and whatever, but there is a legal way that you have to enter in. You have to walk through that bank and you have to sign uh, and, and identify yourself with that account. Well, that's really essentially what faith is doing. It's walking into the account or into the bank of heaven and saying, hey, this inheritance is mine. Now, you could pout, you could cry, you could do it, you could throw a strop, throw yourself down on the footpath outside the bank, scream, uh, you know, bang your hands and all that kind of stuff. Demand from God. But until you go through this process, which he has set up, which is that you receive by faith, so grace is accessed by faith, it says that, this favour of God, all these blessings, the blessing that we're talking about is accessed by faith. It's not accessed by you working. It's not accessed by you throwing tantrums. Now, I'm here to testify. I have tried this. Doesn't happen. You can throw, you can throw fits and I've seen baby Christians do it. I've been one of them. Angry at God, bitter at God. Why? Because the inheritance comes by one way. And, uh, you know, I've tried to work to get this inheritance and frustrated the grace that's been on my life. You see, what, well, what's work's got to do? What's me, me working got to do? Me working has got to do with me being able to boast. It's about me. <laughs> it's about me. <laughs> it, works is, is about what you can do. Faith is about what Jesus has done. And sometimes people that are talking about their faith, people think they're being arrogant. Because what they're doing is saying, well, I've got this in Christ Jesus. People think they're boasting. They're not boasting. They're actually acknowledging and glorifying what the Father has done for them. But people misinterpret and think, well, you know, aren't they arrogant to say that they're healed? I can tell they're not. They're saying they're wealthy. And yet I can see their car. I can see their house. All that kind of stuff. Well, <laughs> the temptation is when people start to do that and persecute you for your faith, the temptation, of course, is to go back and do works because people will accept works. Why? Because it, it lets them get off scot-free. They can go then and do works and boast as well. But if you're living by faith, you're indicting that, that works process. You're indicting that works process in people. And that light, of course, produces um, or shows them their darkness. And so many, many times when we're living by faith and receiving this inheritance, what we'll have is we'll have a persecution, it says in Galatians, of the flesh. It says that, that he that walks in the spirit will be persecuted by the flesh or those that are walking in the flesh. Why? Because intellectually they can't understand why you're receiving things for, well, you know, essentially nothing, but it's not nothing, it's what Jesus has bought and paid for, but they think that you're getting stuff for nothing. And then, of course, when they're working hard and seeing you get things for nothing, of course, they think that this is unjust. And then there comes a persecution 
uh, for you receiving your inheritance. And we have that illustration in Galatians chapter 4. If you want to read it for homework, that would be great. It talks about Sarah and Hagar. And, uh, well, we could go there, actually. And the two covenants that, that the Christians, unfortunately, um, Christians actually, baby Christians, many times, or actually Christians that have heard the word and then slip back into wanting to boast. Many times what they'll do is they'll want to put themselves back under the old covenant. Because in the new covenant, in faith, there is no boasting. And uh, many people want to motivate their life through their boasting. They want people to clap them for what they're doing. You see, and if you don't get claps, we don't do. That's really the whole system of the world. It's based on works and, and you being able to boast and people clapping you uh, for, your, for your incredible prowess. And that becomes the motivation of why you do stuff. But if we take away the claps... We take away the boasting, we find that people many times will just sit still. <laughs> we, we look at them and think, oh, he's a committed person. Look at what he does. Look at how hard he works. But uh, when we examine it, or you know, I've seen it happen, where claps are taken away from people, they just don't do anything. As a matter of fact, they tend to get a little bitter at what's happening. And they get bitter at the thing that they were doing, you see. Why? Because that thing that they used to do that they're no longer paid for, um, uh, or, or that, that, that they were doing, they, they don't get paid for it. And of course, what happens is a bitterness arises in their life. And so I, you know, many times I find that people who are bitter will come and persecute those who are under the blessing. That bitterness draws them uh, to, the, to the people who are being blessed because they're judging them. And we understand that judgments are really uh, people who don't do the word and are wanting, uh, are, are annoyed at people who are receiving stuff that they're not receiving. We could open that up a little bit, but let's, let's have a look at, in Galatians here. Um, Paul, talking to the Galatian Christians, is trying to desperately to get this blessing back onto them. Let's have a look here in verse 14. It says, um, when I came to you, you received me. This is halfway through uh, verse 14. It says, you received me as a messenger from God, even as Jesus Christ himself. So these Galatian Christians, when Paul came along, they received his message. They thought it was the best thing, thing, uh, sin, best, thing oh, I get that right, best thing since sliced bread. They were excited. Why? Let's have a look and see why they were excited. But Paul, looking back now at the Galatians, he's talking to them and he says, So where is your blessing? Well, what happened was when Paul began to preach this message, something came on the Galatians' life. What do you think it was? Well, it was the blessing. It was this ability not to fail, the empowerment to succeed. Let's have a look and see, see what God is doing. God's retrieving this blessing through the redemption of Jesus Christ. You see, the earth lease had in it the blessing. And that's what Jesus has paid back. The blessing is the empowerment to succeed. And this is the important thing. The Father wants you to remain in the blessing. And this is what Paul was concerned about. Paul was concerned about his Christian church because they had left the blessing. It was no longer working in their life. And there was a reason why it was no longer um, verse 15, it says, So where is this blessing? I bear witness of you. 
If it had been possible, you would have even plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Now, many people go off in, on a tangent and say, well, look, Paul was blind, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, they've made up these amazing um, diseases that he carried. This is the same guy who went right around the world <laughs> preaching the gospel. They're always trying to make him sick. Now, he might have been sick on occasions. doesn't say that he was sick. He says that he had infirmities or weaknesses. Uh, at, at specific times, but this is a guy who's getting, you know, persecuted, whipped, stoned, all sorts of things happening to him. And now he might have <laughs> been suffering or under recovery at certain stages, and uh, this is what I believe has happened here. But um, this is an exclamation. He said, Paul is talking to the Galatians, he said, Well, when I first preached to you, look, you would have plucked out. It's a way of saying, I was. I was such, I was so dear to you. You loved me so much when I began to preach this because your life started to change. This blessing started to affect you. But he's saying, what's happened? So where's this blessing now? Well, what's transpired in the Galatians is they've stopped listening to Paul. They've started to listen to other preachers. And these preachers were preachers of the law because they're trying to get back under the law. This is what Paul's arguing to them. You, you're not under the law. How can you go back under something that's been dissolved and put aside? And he goes on and he explains, if you go and start to operate by the law, what's going to happen is that you're going to annul this blessing that comes only through the redemption of Jesus. It doesn't come through behaviour. Now, people like changing their lives through behaviour. They don't like to receive, well, you know, they do, this, this group of people did, but what happens is that your flesh likes to glory or it likes to boast or it likes to think it's done something. And that then becomes the motivation for doing something else. Paul saying that is not how you receive the blessing. I bear witness that you would have even plucked out your own eyes. Then he says something quite peculiar in verse 16. He says, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Now, I have noticed that people who go back and want to glorify themselves through the flesh <laughs> quickly become your enemy. If you're preaching that you will obtain things by faith, now I think I'm, you know, we talked about the people who throw tantrums, <laughs> who, who, who are outside the bank, uh, you know, on the footpath, kicking and screaming because they can't get their inheritance. They don't want to walk through the door of the bank. And it's almost like we could say that's the redemption of Jesus, Jesus the anointed. They don't want to walk through the door who is Jesus Christ, they want to get in another way. And we've got to be careful of that. So there is only one way to this blessing, and it's through the redemption of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. You can't work yourself into this blessing. You must receive it by faith. And this is exactly what Paul said. Now, what he's saying is the Galatians, suddenly he's become their enemy. Why? Because he's preaching another way other than works, which is the faith way. And suddenly they've become a little embittered towards Paul. This is the same guy who started them off. He's their father in the faith. Now they're angry because they've been listening to the wrong message. So who you listen to and what preachers you listen to is important. Who you listen to is very important because it affects the way you believe. And uh, verse 17, a very important verse, it says, they would zealously influence you, but not favorably. What's he saying? Well, he's saying, well, let's go on and read it a bit more. Yes, they would exclusively control you so that you might have to consult them. What's he, what's he talking about? He's talking about people who say, oh, I think what you need to do if you're going to succeed is you need to sign up with our organisation. What, what's he talking about? He's talking about preachers who are trying to control their sheep and manipulate their sheep. 
but not for the sheep's sake. I don't know how you would manipulate for the sheep's sake anyway, but it, what he's saying is that these people are manipulating people. Why? So that they will be affected. They will be affected. That means that they will receive benefit from, if you like, the sheep. So they're not this, they're, they're, they're hirelings. They're people who aren't interested in the flock. They're interested in how the flock is going to affect them. Now, I've told you many times, you know, <laughs> when I was younger and uh, I was in, uh, and now this is not to say that uh, the circles that I mixed in later weren't exactly the same, but when I was uh, younger, I was in uh, some evangelical circle, uh, circles and uh, one of the things that... Um, at a particular convention I remember going to, was that they would, uh, they would preach condemnation and then they would ask for all those people who, who, who would like to respond to come down the front. And I remember going at this particular time and, and uh, you know, and I was a little bit convicted uh, or condemned. I'm not sure which. I'm pretty sure. Anyway, went down the front and, uh, you know, I was, the, the preacher was waiting down the front and I came down the front <laughs> I was expecting him to be, you know, really. And I could see he was a little bit annoyed at the fact that I, came, whilst I came down for help, he was, he didn't really want to give his life away to me. And uh, he's not the only one. There's others that I know had asked me to come down the front. But really the coming down the front wasn't about me. I realised it was about them getting a, if you like, uh, numbers or an outward show of how effective they've been preaching. And of course, what we're saying is that's not thinking about the sheep, that's thinking about themselves. And this is exactly what Paul's saying. He's saying these guys who are preaching the law, they're not, pre they're not thinking about you. You're saying, I'm thinking about you, I want this blessing on your life. And why are you angry at me? <laughs> why are you angry? Why have you got angry? Well, one of the reasons you're angry is because you want to boast. But the way that I'm preaching doesn't allow you to do that. And I understand that you're angry at me. <laughs> because my way of preaching won't let you get paid. That's what Paul's essentially saying. He's saying this blessing is all about what Jesus has done, not what you can do. But these people who are preaching it, they are not preaching the redemption of Jesus Christ. They might be preaching self-improvement, but they're not preaching the inheritance that's in Christ Jesus. And he goes on and he talks about these two types of messages. Now, these two types of messages are in the Christian church. That's what we're saying. Remember, we, 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 we talked about Paul and Barnabas getting criticised because of what they preached by the Judaistic Christians, people who wanted to put Christians under Judaism. That's under, under the blood of, of bulls and goats so that they have to work their way out of sin. Paul's message was that sin has been eradicated by the blood of Jesus Christ. There is nothing more that you can do to get accepted by the Father other than receive what Jesus has done. That is the good news. But that's the empowering uh, good news. Praise the Lord. Okay, and then he goes, uh, so <laughs> in verse 21, he goes on and he begins to speak and teach these Galatians about an allegory. He says, tell me, you who desire to be under law or do works, we could say it like that, don't you see in the law, in the old covenant, there's an illustration of two covenants. And he goes on, he says, for it's written that Abraham had two sons. What's he talking about? Two types of doctrines. One was by a slave woman, and the other by a free woman. So what he's saying is that these two types of covenants produce, number one, slaves, or number two, free children. And then he goes on, he says, but he who was of the slave woman, who was born after the senses or after the flesh, uh, I'll read that again. He who was of the slave woman was born after the flesh, but he, oh, sorry, 
I will read it again. For it is written that Abraham had two sons. Not doing too well on this, am I? Uh, but I will. The one by the slave woman, the other by the free woman. But he who was of the slave woman was born according to the flesh. That's what I'm trying to say. It was, there was nothing supernatural about the, the one that was born by Hagar. It was something that was created by the flesh, by the senses, by works, if you like. Uh, but he who was of the free woman was was created through promise. You see, the difference between um, these two covenants is, is that one that you can do yourself, the other one you have to rely on the Father to give it to you. You have to believe. And he says, these things are an allegory for these are two covenants. So what's he talking about? He's talking about two different types of covenants in the Christian church. You might not realize that there are two covenants being preached in the Christian church. And if you listen to one, you'll be without inheritance, without the blessing. If you listen to the other, you'll be blessed. But the, I'll tell you what, the, it's appealing <laughs> one covenant's appealing to the flesh, the other's appealing to the spirit. Praise God. Uh, and he goes on. Um, will we read this? Yes, look, why don't we read These are an allegory for their two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to slavery, which is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. And represents the present or the natural Jerusalem and is now in bondage with the children. So what he's saying is that the Jewish religion produces uh, things out of the flesh. It's not going to produce spiritual children. It's going to produce fleshly children. But the Jerusalem which is above, which he's talking about, the heaven that we started out talking about, this is heaven that we can access through faith. Uh, the Jerusalem which is above is free, which is your mother. So what's he doing to the Galatians? He's saying you are really born out of the spiritual Jerusalem, not the natural one. So he's separating Christians here. And he goes on and says, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear, break forth and shout, you who have no labor pains. That means... Those people who aren't working can start rejoicing. For the desolate has many more children than she who has an husband. So what we're finding here is that the spirit is able to produce much more than, him, uh, than the, the person who has a natural husband. You see. And so as Christians, we want to be in this covenant that produces the abundance of blessing. Now we brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as it was then, he who was born after the senses persecuted him who was born after the spirit. This is exactly what I'm talking about, guys. When you begin to believe this blessing on the inside of you and you start to manifest it, you start to preach it to people, you will get persecuted by people who are in the senses, in the flesh. Those who are trying to achieve so they can get claps and boast. They are not going to enjoy your life. They, don't, they, they seriously don't enjoy this message that I'm preaching. They didn't enjoy it in Paul's day either. And so he was terribly persecuted. He, he had persecution coming all the time as he preached this message. Why? Because this message had the ability to take people from the curse into the blessing. And there are people who, and, and as soon as we do this, if we go over to Galatians 4, actually, let, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 4, let's find out one of the antagonisms Uh, that, that begins to manifest as we preach this message. Now, Paul, in, in, in chapter, three of verse, uh, <laughs> chapter 3 of Romans, what he's doing is he's talking about the righteousness that Jesus, or we could say sinlessness, whatever you want to call it, 
the rightness of God or the sinlessness of God coming into humanity by faith, not by, not by works. And there's this big contrast there in, in Romans 3. He says, but now in, in, in verse 21 of, of, let's have a look at it, of uh, chapter 3, he says, but now apart from the law, here we go again, apart from the law, this is not under the law, but now apart from the law, the righteousness, the sinlessness of God is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So what he's saying is that the law actually witnessed or was pointing to the fact that there was going to be a time where people will be sinless without works, that Jesus was going to make them sinless and they wouldn't have to use the blood of bulls and goats to cover them and they'll be able to access the throne of God. So this is what Paul's talking about. He's talking about this new righteousness that doesn't come from working, that doesn't come from the law. Uh, and he goes on, verse 22, the righteousness of God which comes through faith in Jesus to all and everyone who believes. So there we go. We, we, we've seen, uh, and then verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a mercy seat through faith in his blood for the demonstration of his righteousness. Uh, we could go on. Look, that's, that's uh, let's go down to verse 27 because I want you to see what we're talking about. Where is boasting then in this new righteousness? Where is it? Where is this boasting? Where, how, how can you boast? Boasting is excluded. Verse 27. By what law? Of works? No, because when you're doing works, you can boast. He said, no, by the law of faith or the law of believing. You see, there is no boasting when you start believing what Jesus has done for you. Why? Because you have no part in it. As a matter of fact, if you have a look at it, when Adam condemned you to sin, you really, you, you, you can't even boast about that. Why? Because Adam, he, he committed the whole human race to condemnation. But when Jesus came, he committed the whole human race, race and creation into righteousness. So essentially, that takes away every bit of works in your life. And that's what Paul's saying. You can't boast about this stuff. And this is where people get offended. They can't boast about the faith life. No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the works of the law. That means that how do we get right with God? We don't do it through the law. We do it through the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Praise God. This is good preaching, guys. You might think it's a little heavy, but it is the way into the blessing. You need to get this down. You need to understand this basic principle of righteousness by faith. That is what Paul's on about here in Romans. He's getting people into the blessing. He's arguing the blessing. He's saying you are blessed not by what you do, not what the law could do, but you're blessed by what Jesus has done. And so all you have to do is to receive. But in Galatians, he says, if you, uh, if you are going to live like this, there are going to be certain people who aren't going to enjoy your life. And they are going to come up and they are going to pressure you. You see, he who lives a godly life will be persecuted, says, he says in Timothy. He says to Timothy, you see, when you begin to live this life of the blessing, there is persecution. Now, it's coming through people, but we understand we're not fighting flesh and blood. We're fighting spirits. Now, spirits love the law. Demons love the law because that's how they work. They work through human activity. They work through human boasting, through human works. That's how Satan builds his kingdom. That's how he's building the, the Babylonian system now. If you go back to Genesis chapter, I think it's Genesis chapter 6, we find that, that, that humanity began to build the Tower of Babel. Well, what was the Tower of Babel? It was works. It talks about the contrast of how they mixed up um, 
uh, they mixed up uh, certain uh, concoctions to make bricks instead of using stone. And there's this contrast of, of how they began to use things that God hadn't ordained. They started to do their own thing. And God, really, God, that, that, which actually brought judgment on their life. And God down, came down and destroyed the Terror of Babel and sent them away. And Nimrod, who was the leader of that, um, you, you see there, there were leaders. He, he, gave, he said, lest we, we spread amongst the, we're all separated and spread amongst the whole earth. Let's do this. God had said, I want you to multiply, I want you to go out and become nations. And Nimrod really was, was trying to get everyone to disobey God and stay as one, one group. That was the beginning of the system of Babel. Now Satan uses this Babylonian system to build his, his kingdom through works. God is using faith to build his kingdom. That's just a little side note. Okay, so let's go into... Uh, to, um, Chapter 4, and then we're going to finish here. I think we'll finish. Um, 4 verse 1. We're talking about enabling the blessing. There's a certain... You, this blessing comes through the doctrine of faith, where we access God's grace through faith, not through works. This is what we're talking about. This is basic 101 Christianity of how to maintain the blessing on your life. If you're wanting to boast, watch out there's a good chance that you have a certain doctrine on the inside of you, which you will need to cast out, it says in Galatians. What shall we say then? Abraham, our father, according to the flesh, is found. If Abraham was justified by what he did, or works, he has something to boast about. Can you see this? Abraham wasn't a boaster. Abraham, actually, if you think about it, well, you know, there was a stage where he, he probably was boasting, but he got to a stage where he wasn't. The very fact that um, Hagar, uh, sorry, Ishmael was born by Hagar was a time where he was in the flesh. He was saying, I'm going to work independently of you, God. He, got, he really got over the fact that God's promise wasn't coming to pass. He was on the outside, he and Sarah, outside the bank, throwing a tantrum, <laughs> kicking and screaming, saying, well, it's not happening. And, and of course, what happened? Well, they got into the flesh and they started to, to do, uh, you know, build the, the system of Babel. They started to do their own works. They started to create, if you like, create their own ministry. <laughs> but God, God can't use that. Um, and, and what God had was he, he had a ministry for Abraham that was going to bring Jesus in and the whole redemption. But, but Abraham got out of that momentarily. But here we have in the New Testament, God looking at Abraham the way that he originally saw him. And that's through faith. God looks at you through faith. He's not looking at all your works, all your failures. And he doesn't want you to look at past failures either. He wants you to look to Jesus, who is going to redeem all those past failures out of your life. So you don't have to look in the past to find out where you are with God. God and faith are now. So you don't have to go back and make up. Now, God might, might, might take you through and you might, you might um, end up blessing people that, that you know, at one stage where you, you may have been uh, you may have been selfish, you may have used people, all that kind of stuff. We're talking about that. God might bring you back to there, but that, that sin's been dealt with in Jesus and you need to rely on him to get to... Uh, to uh, you don't have to make up. I think that's what I'm trying to say. You might have done some terrible things in your life that Jesus had paid the price for. Now, he might take you back to where you actually help people that you might have hurt before. That's great. And, and that's wonderful. But Jesus has paid the price for every failure. There's some things that you might not be able to, to, um, to fix up. Jesus has paid the price for that. And you need to receive forgiveness for that. You need to forgive yourself for that. You, to be able to move on, you need to be able to receive the, the forgiveness and the blessing that comes through that forgiveness and through that redemption. God's not looking at you 
as guilty anymore. He's looking at you through the eyes of faith. Now, what do we say here? If Abraham was justified by works, he would have had something to boast about, but not before God. Why? Because the scripture says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for sinlessness. Praise God. Guys, when you believe in the redemption of Jesus Christ, that is the new covenant. And what's going to happen is that this new covenant of love is going to come on your life and blessing follows love. Why? Because love is God. God is love. When you start to submit to the love law of Jesus Christ, when you start to acknowledge what he's done on the inside, this blessing's going to flow out. You're going to start fixing up, uh, you know, in, in, a, in the right way, you're going, to, you're going to start fixing up this world that's broken down. You're going to help people get back on track. That blessing's going to start moving out and you're going to eradicate failure, not only in your life, but in the lives of others. Praise God. We're going to have to finish there, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you uh, probably Thursday night. We're going to uh, have another, uh, another, another seminar, another uh, teaching time where we're teaching you the Word of God so that you can remain in the blessing and you'll be able to share that blessing with those around you. Praise God. We'll see you next time, guys. Mm-hmm.